one of the most difficult days that any of us can imagine. Uh, we're often prone to say it's the most difficult day of all time. I'm not certain that's the case, but it's certainly one of the most difficult days of our time. Uh, pressure moves in unusual ways and causes us to head in directions that we never intended to go. And we have this need then to find ourselves and working ourselves back to God and back to the Father with uh, the highest of urgency. There's an interesting story about a small young man, his name is Bobby. <coughs> it was his first key ball game ever. And he was ready to play because his dad had taught him everything he needed to know about playing t-ball. That's dangerous. It was Bobby's time to <coughs> get back. And since it was t-ball, it was pretty obvious he was going to he was going to hit something at least. I didn't I don't know exactly quite what he did, get. but he was going to hit something. And Bobby walked up to the plate with a swagger that would have made a Ken Griffey Jr. in his day, or a Sammy Sosa, or uh, Mark McGuire, or any of those guys jealous because his dad had taught him one thing, and it was get the swipe down, get the style down. And when he finally cranked up and made his swing at the ball, he let it fly. The hit sailed into the outfield. And if you've been to a t-ball game, you have this picture right now in your mind of what happened to the t-ball game. Uh, there are many kids, and they're running, trying to figure out what's going on. It's kind of like a bunch of flies going in, in, in one direction. And they're, 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 they're very young. And they take off, you know, they set up the scramble, and sure enough, they're moving all in the direction of retrieving it. Bobby was excited. He knew that he just had his first hit. And all of a sudden, he heard this loud message, Bobby, run, <laughs> screamed his coach as loud as he could, Bobby, run. The boy looked around and realized time was running out because the scrambling was kind of uh, coming together. And he took off as only that little kid could do and ran like a jackrabbit. And in spite of that momentary lapse of the play, it looked like he probably had an in-the-park home run. As he rounded second base, his coach cupped his hands. And the coach, and you know, they are intense, T-ball. <laughs> his coach cupped his hands and yelled, Bobby, run. Run for home. Bobby did exactly <laughs> Things together and uh, 
the best thing you can do is to remember that all the rest of it can fail. But give me Jesus. And I, and I end up and I, and I run toward home as fast as my spiritual feet will carry me. Now that's exactly what John the, the Baptist did. I know you were searching for a scripture reference. This is where you'll find it. Let me give you a, a direction in the scripture. You'll find it in the Gospel according to Matthew, the 11th chapter. And I'm going to read to you the first six verses. And listen with me as we read about John the Baptist. After Jesus had finished instructing his 12 disciples, he went on from there to teach and to preach in the towns of Galilee. When John, John the Baptist, heard in prison that what Christ was doing, he sent disciples to ask him, they ask him, they ask him two questions. Are you the one who was to come? Or should we be waiting on another? Are you the one who was to come? Or should we be waiting on another? Jesus replied, go back and tell John what you hear and what you see. Tell him the blind receive sight, the lame walk, those who have leprosy are cured, the deaf hear, the dead are raised, the good news is preached to the poor. Blessed is the man who does not fall away on account of me. It's a great passage of scripture. You see, it, 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 it quickly reveals one of the two things I want us to remember today. And the first one is that doubts are always the most severe in the dark. Doubts are always the most severe in the dark. I do not remember who wrote it, and I don't even remember what I learned it, but I remember many years ago in the early days of preaching, I learned a little piece of poetry. It was a, it was a, it was a good piece, and it was a simple piece. And it said, the apples falling from the tree make such a heavy thump at night. I always am surprised to see that it's just the apples falling from the tree. You see, doubts are the most severe in the dark. John was a non, John the Baptist was a non-paying guest in Herod's death row. And he was troubled. It wasn't because of the accommodations. Remember, we're talking about John the Baptist. He was used to roughing it. This is the guy who, who lived in the desert. This is the guy who would go out and grab a few locusts when he needed a little bit of protein. And when he needed something sweet, he would find some wild honey. He, he wasn't even particularly troubled about being on death row. He just wanted to make sure that if I'm going to give my life for something or someone, I want to be certain it's the right cause. He'd spend his entire adult life being consumed with the Messiah. But now here he is and he's troubled. The longer he sat in that dreary cell, the more troubled he became. The walls started to close in, and John found himself, or found, it, I should say, found it more difficult and, and, and tougher by the day to, to keep the faith. And finally, he made a decision. What, what would it hurt? What would it hurt if I sent a message to this Jesus? What would it hurt if I, if I just asked him a couple of questions? <coughs> John somehow or another got that message out of that prison. And when John heard all of that, he told them, he said, I need you to find Jesus and ask him just two things. Are you the one? Or should we be expecting someone else? What do you do when you come to that time in life when discouragement literally floods your soul, I mean, it comes in and it rolls and it's in waves. And you're not able to go on. What do 
do you do when you come to that point in life when your efforts seem to be diving? And you, you question everything you've ever done. Now, I don't need to take a poll this morning because it's a fairly human condition. We all get there eventually. What do you do at that time? John did exactly the right thing. I mean, here he is bottoming out in a cell. He knows he's going to die. He knows that the, that the, that the confinement is rough. And he knows that he'll probably be, uh, he'll probably have his head connected from the rest of his body when he, when he does die. He, he understands all of that. But what do you do when it all kind of closes in? John did exactly the right thing. He ran straight toward home. He didn't worry about finishing all the bases. He went straight to the King of Kings and straight to the Lord of the Lords. Now, he may have been a little confused. He may have been somewhat troubled. I, I, I think I would have been. He's probably a little bit uncertain. At the very, very least, he was discouraged. But he was right on with his question. His question, let me paraphrase it, was, I need to know, I need to know, are you the source? He didn't run out and pout and consider all of his options. He simply took the initiative. Reading in between the lines, a little paraphrase of John and the Baptist, I think it would be something like this. I believe you're the one. Look, I've, I've been giving my life for you, and I'm going to continue to give my life for you. But if I'm going to die, I just want to know that you're the source. Now, why was it that John was in this precarious spot. Could it have been that his, that his expectations were not being fulfilled? That this Jesus that he had preached and proclaimed, Jesus that he had baptized himself, didn't seem to be establishing his kingdom as rapidly as he thought it should happen? The corrupt religious uh, establishment was still very much intact. For that matter, so was the entire uh, Roman Empire. You see, John was confused because his faith and his logic had kind of collided. And they weren't seemingly going in the right direction. And he needed to recenter himself a little bit, and he wanted to make sure that this messianic train, this messianic message that he preached was, was on the right track. And just as it occurs with us from time to time, John was discouraged, John was weak. However, I'll have to admit, he handled it a whole lot better than I did. He just told the master, straight up, as close as he could get, sent his messengers. He said, you know, I'm confused. I'm a little bit discouraged. And I need some clarification. Wow, what a prayer. I need some clarification. Are you the one? Or should I be looking for another? John was a man with a burning, burning sense of, of, of mission. John was a person with an Incredible self-control. He was a strong man. He was a, he was a, he, he, he was a, he was a man of convictions. His road, his journey in life would inevitably bring him into conflict with authorities. And he was prepared to pay the price. But nevertheless, when he was alone, when it was dark, kind of came to a dead end, and he hit that wall of discouragement, that wall of confusion, because doubts are the most severe when they're in the dark. Well, if you read anything about uh, religious 
Charles Spurgeon was a great generation, a great preacher of a couple of generations ago, and the greatest of the great, and his sermons today are so incredible to read. And, uh, I, I, I guess I'd have to say I'm a Spurgeon fan. But his long ministry, nearly every Monday and Tuesday, Charles Spurgeon tells the, the, the story of his long ministry. Almost every Monday before Tuesday, he would receive a really, really, really sharp letter. Now, I don't mean sharp in the sense of well written. I mean sharp in the sense of cutting. And that letter would always come from the same person. You would think after a while, as a pastor, a seasoned pastor, all those years, you learned it, to disregard those little bombshells. But he always opened them. He always read them. They always caused him great pain and great frustration. They never failed to make their mark. Each letter dripped, Spurgeon said, with discouragement as this self-appointed critic <coughs> seemed to know exactly the right words to say to Charles Spurgeon to just slice it. John the Baptist was, was, was on the eve, 
And when that supply is gone, guess what happens? We become discouraged. We are empty of courage. It runs out. And we must come into His presence to find the source again. Now, God planned it that way. He planned it that way so that we would maintain a relationship with Him. And we would be perpetually returning to Him as the source of our strength. But the reason He did that was He desires a continual relationship with you. When the scripture says in Ephesians 5, chapter 18, verse, be filled with the Spirit, a literal translation of that points toward a continuous all the time filling rather than a one time filling. Be filled every hour, be filled every day. Why? Why would that be? Because, because you're going to dry up. Because everyday relationships are going to drain you. The pressures of life are going to deplete you. The walls of a prison, John the Baptist would say, are going to close in. Struggles with the evil one, whatever form or shape he takes, will continually drag you down. And God says, be sure to run home. And I'll fill you. I need to know, are you the one? Or do I need to seek another? Now, normally we don't like to give him much credit on Sunday morning in a church service, but let me give you a little insight into the evil one himself. Satan knows that we can only go so far on an untaxable. And he does everything he can to keep us from being refilled. Just as he did with John the Baptist. Well, I hope you remember the doubts are always the most severe when they come at night. Remember also that spiritual encouragement is a renewable source by design. And then a few questions. Where do you look or turn when you come to the day?
we did ask that your word would speak to us. And our prayer is that it has in this moment. Let it penetrate. Let it be something that we carry with us. Let us not forget that you're speaking. Now for just a moment of directed prayer with your head bowed and your eyes closed. Would you simply pray in your own way that God would turn your heart toward home? 